folks, it's Miss Sinclair for AP World History Modern. Today we are continuing on with our Unit 4 lectures on transoceanic interconnections. We are pausing with our learning about the Americas and looking to the Eastern Hemisphere at Japan. So today's lecture is um, on Japanese reunification. So I want you to think back to last unit. Think about two changes and continuities with the Indian Ocean trade system from what you've known before and what you've learned this unit so far. And then I want you to think back to our gunpowder empires. What are two similarities and two differences? So today we are learning about Japanese reunification. So this is in line with topic 4.4 of our AP course description. So you will be able to explain the process of state building and expansion among various empires and states in the period 1450 to 1750. The other objectives we are covering today include uh, being able to explain continuities and changes in economic and labor systems, and being able to explain changes and continuities in systems of slavery. So let's look at Japan. It's been quite a while since we've talked about Japan directly, but gosh, perhaps the last time we really talked about Japan was in Unit 1. But when we left off, we talked about how Japan had gone through the Taika reforms where they had really wanted to become like China, how you had a pushback from that and the establishment of the shogunates with the Ashikaga shogunate to begin with. A shogunate, if you remember, is a method of government with a warlord, right? So we are in the era of Japanese feudalism. So you still have a Japanese emperor, but the guy who's actually in charge, who holds power, will be the shogun. And then you have local lords known as daimyos. So in the 12th century, you have this massive civil war, the Genpai Civil War. In it, you see all of our different daimyos going to war with each other using their samurai. So samurai are like the equivalent of knights. So the question is really who's in power? Well, we see that this massive civil war will encompass all of Japan. And by the 16th century, by the 1500s, you see the decline of the Ashikaga shogunate because they have been unable to keep order in this period, and there's a need to restore unity. So in 1573, Nobunaga Toyotomi Hideyoshi is going to end the Ashikaga shogunate because of extensive use of firearms. So this new weaponry will allow one group to bring an end to the civil war. By 1580, Nobunaga will be able to unify much of the island of Honshu and drive out the armies um, against the Western daimyos who are still holding out. But he dies early. He dies in 1582 before he is able to complete his conquests. So his general, Toyotomi, Hideyoshi, so you got Nobunaga, our first general. Then you have Toyotomi Hideyoshi, our second general. He is going to continue Nobunaga's campaign and will establish leadership over Japan by 1590. Toyotomi uh, Hideyoshi is going to attempt to invade Korea a number of times in the 1590s, but it's going to be really fairly unsuccessful. It's bad for Korea, it's bad for China, but it's not necessarily very good for Japan. The Japanese invasion is incredibly violent, it is very oppressive, and they don't necessarily get a ton out of it. 
So when Toyotomi Hideyoshi dies in 1589, you have a continued struggle for succession. So sure, Nobunaga ends the civil war especially, but you don't have stable leadership until you have the rise of the Tokugawa shogunate. So Tokugawa Iwayasu will sort of win this contest for succession after Hideyoshi's death. And he establishes the Tokugawa shogunate, which will be the last of the three shogunates in Japan and will um, continue on for hundreds of years. So one of the things that Iwayasu does that makes him so clever um, is, remember, throughout all of this, you still have an emperor. Um, so Tokugawa Iwayasu is not going to continue Hideyoshi's military campaigns outside of Japan. Instead, he is going to focus on consolidating power at home, right? That was one of the weaknesses of um, Toyotomi Hideyoshi is that he didn't have a um, solid um, power base at home from which to start invading China and Korea. So instead, he's going to reorganize the remaining daimyos. And he will use a policy known as alternative attendance. So daimyos are forced to spend every other year at the Tokugawa court. So one of the problems, one of the reasons why we had a civil war in the first place was because you had all of these daimyos in the various corners of Japan. Remember, Japan is very mountainous. And it's made up of lots and lots of islands. So it's very easy for a daimyo to remain pretty isolated and then slowly gather power and influence until he becomes a threat to the shogun. So to keep that, you see that the daimyos are forced to spend extensive amounts of time in the court. And when they were allowed to go back to their far-flung provinces, their wives and children would remain in the court, right? It was the idea of like, oh, well, why would you want your wife to travel so far? It's so dangerous. Her friends are here. There's educational opportunities for your children. Trust me. No, it's fine. You go back, deal with your farmers and whatever. We'll look after and keep your family safe, a.k.a. your family is hostage at the court, so when you go back home, make sure you don't get up into any funny business. One benefit of this is that the daimyos traveling back and forth will mean you have the buildup of better infrastructure. Since they're on the road all the time, they want good roads. So you see the development of maritime transportation and road infrastructure. The Tokugawas will rule from the city of Edo which is modern day Tokyo. <clears throat> and their victory will really put an end to the civil wars and bring political unity and centralization to Japan based on their own military power and political skills. The shoguns will give Japan two centuries of, uh, of internal peace. So this is a great video. Um, of the rise of the Tokugawa shogunate. So what are the results of all of this? Well, less fighting, right? Um, because the daimyos are forced to sustain two households, right? One in Edo and one back at home. They can't acquire wealth like they had before. They can't acquire sort of an army they um, are going to have more peace, less fighting. You have an increase in food production and an increase of importing food, which will lead to an increase in the population. Part of this is because the discovery of the Americas and as crops from the Americas start to percolate across Asia, it will lead to an increase in the carrying capacity of the land. You see the continued influence of Confucianism in Japanese culture. You see high literacy rates with novels and the ability to mass produce literature 
using a woodblock printing press. This is a great time in Japan for arts. Steel production, pottery, lacquer, porcelain, sake. You have lots of wealthy merchants. And one of the things that we'll see is that these merchants will develop direct relationships with different daimyos, which actually undermines the power of the Tokugawa government. You also see the rise of something called kabuki theater. It's becoming very popular, especially among the upper classes. So you still see a lot of independence for daimyos. In general, though, we just have a period of stability. Your social hierarchy has samurai and daimyos at the top, then peasants, then artisans and merchants are still at the bottom, right? You still have that Confucian influence with merchants not being highly valued. Within the court, there are very specific rules about where you can live, how you can style your hair, your makeup, how deep you should bow. So this is a highly sort of ritualized society. This video is not required, but it is fun to help you learn a little bit about kabuki theater during this time period. So how was Japan reunified and what were the results? Let's talk about Japanese contact with Europeans. So during this time period, meanwhile, while Japan's getting its issues sorted out, the Portuguese have arrived in the Indian Ocean and other European states follow shortly. They start to do contact and trade with Africa, with India, with Southeast Asia, and even make their way through the Strait of Malacca to the South China Sea. If you remember, Portugal is actually going to gain control of the Strait of Malacca. So they arrive in Japan and are going to start doing business. The contact with Europeans is going to create new opportunities as well as new problems. So the Europeans arrive when Japan is plagued by endemic conflict between the daimyos and the samurai. So they are actually highly welcomed. The military technology, the shipbuilding skills, the geographic knowledge of the world, this is all going to be really useful for Japanese leaders. It also creates some commercial opportunities for others and an opportunity for missionary work for the Catholic Church, specifically the Jesuits. So it's the Europeans who really bring a lot of the firearms to... Japan. If you remember, the firearms originally came from China, but the Europeans are the ones who really developed weaponry effectively because they're always fighting each other. So they bring the guns back to Asia, leave them in the Middle East or leave them in Japan, and the Japanese really improve upon them. So in general, at first, we're going to see that Japan really welcomes highly regulated trade with Portugal, Spain, Netherlands, and England. However, apart from the firearms, Europe is in the same problem that it was in in our first lecture. There's a lot of things Europeans want from Asia and almost nothing Asia wants from Europe, right? The porcelain, the steel, the lacquer, like all the art, these are all highly appealing to European merchants. But what do they have to offer? Fur? Great, cool, we have fur in Japan. So you have sort of this imbalance of trade. European traders begin visiting the islands with increasing numbers from 1543 onward after the Portuguese first make conduct, contact after shipwrecking on the Japanese coast. So it is the introduction of the firearms from Europeans that will shift Japan from sort of a feudal system to a more modern system. And the Europeans will also bring with them missionaries, specifically Jesuit missionaries. So if remember the Jesuits, um, the Society of Jesus are, is going to be one of the results of the counter-reformation in the Catholic Church. 
the arrival of these Christians is really a mixed reaction, right? Originally, it's um, leadership isn't really worried about these Christians, right? They don't see them as a threat. But over time, elites will oppose Christianity as disruptive as and foreign. This is in part because so many lower class and ordinary Japanese are really going to like it. They are going to convert to Christianity by the thousands. By the early 17th century, aka the 1600s, there are over 300,000 Christians in Japan. But the shogun is suspicious of Christianity and very hostile to it. So, in 1614, Christianity is banned and its adherents are, um, are accused of trying to overthrow the government. They're not doing that. The Jesuits are walking around telling people about Jesus. In 1617, the persecution of Christians begins. Beheading, crucifixions, torture, forced denial. So the way Christians are persecuted in Japan is really horrific. So you see the image um, on the screen of the guy hanging upside down. One of the things that they would do is they would tie you up, hang you upside down, and then put a little nick in your neck. So as you're, you know, imagine hanging upside down from the monkey bars, right? After a couple moments, like the blood starts pumping in your head. That's going to be happening here, but also you feel the blood dripping down your face as it slowly drains out of you into the hole that your head is put in. And they usually put wood around you. So you're just there in the dark, slowly bleeding out, hanging upside down. They would ask Christians to commit something called fumi, where you would be forced to deny um, Christ and you know either spit on or step on a crucifix. I think one thing that's important to note here is that the Christians in Japan are Catholic. So when Christianity is banned and all the Jesuit priests and monks are kicked out of Japan, that means you have no ordained priests from the Catholic Church left to serve the Christians who are left living in secrecy. So remember what we said about Catholic belief last unit, about how the church holds a lot of power and how you communicate grace and salvation through the sacraments? Well, the only people who can administer the sacraments, baptism, communion, confession, are priests. So without any priests on the islands, the Japanese Christians are out of luck. They can't receive God's grace. This is a scene from a movie called Silence. I would encourage you to watch it. It is, um, it's not an easy scene to watch. It's not an easy movie to watch. It's directed by Martin Scorsese. It's based on a really moving book. And it looks at the persecution of Christians in Japan and sort of what it means to have faith in the context of this. So Christians are highly persecuted um, by the Tokugawa shogunate and the Buddhists in Japan in general. So overall, Japan starts turning away from Europe. They start turning towards isolationism. It's hard because they really want some of the Western military goods. But ultimately, European trade and culture will be viewed as a threat to Japan's recent reunification. So they will limit contact with Europeans, specifically to keep Christianity from coming back. And Europeans who come into Japan illegally are killed. Japanese have, citizens have to prove that they are Buddhist. Um, they would look through goods coming in to Japan through the one allowed port to make sure there's no secret Christian goods, you know, no secret crosses in there or anything. So 
By 1616, foreign traders are confined to a few cities. By 1630, Japanese ships are forbidden to trade or sail overseas. By 1640, the island of Deshima is the only place where trade can occur with Europeans. And by the 18th century, so 1700s, you have the School of National Learning established, which is Neo-Confucianism in its foundation, right? Remember, Neo-Confucianism is going to be um, kind of like Confucian fundamentalism. So where are they allowed to trade? On the island of Deshima, this is the only place where you can do trade with other countries. And the only European state who was allowed to do this was the Dutch. And yet, the notion that Japan is a closed country is a very Eurocentric point of view. They still had contact and relationships with their neighboring Asian neighbors, but it's going to really, they're going to shut out Europe. They're able to do this primarily because they're an island. Right? It's much harder to do when you can't control all of your borders. So, over time, we see the population growth starts to really put a strain on the system. The shogun is unable to ultimately stabilize rice prices. And this is going to be really hard on the samurai who are paid in rice and... Um, Rice brokers begin to manipulate prices to keep the samurai poor. The legitimacy of the shogun really rests on the lord and the samurai, the lords and the samurai, the daimyos. And they have really accepted the idea that agriculture should be the basis of the economy, not trade, right? This is a very Confucian idea. But instead, decentralization didn't stop commercial activities. Japan also is a, um, has a lot of silver in it. So they will take the silver to invest in industry. They will start to protect their dwindling forests. So one of the things you'll see um, if you take AP art history and you're learning about art from this period is you'll learn about how the native forests in Japan were almost destroyed completely, but the government is going to intervene to protect them. Families begin to slow population growth with later marriage, fewer children. So the results are, in general, slowed down growth, a delayed ecological crisis, and a highly commercialized economy. Japan is right to be worried about Europe. I mean, think about what's going to happen with the rest of the world in terms of European influence and colonization. But... They are also going to shut themselves apart from a lot of technology and innovation through their actions as well. So, in what ways does Japan interact with Europeans? Compare this to the way different other regions interacted with Europeans. Let's do some practice questions. Which of the following factors led to political unification in Japan between 1500 and 1800? Where's my question two? That's supposed to be question two. Sorry. The Japanese response to Francis Xavier and this is the Society of Jesus. So Francis Xavier was a Jesuit. Um, was. After the period of civil wars ended in Japan, Japanese, oops, sorry. Um, 
So please explain the process of state building and expansion in Japan in the period 1450 to 1750. Since this was a short lecture, I do want you to watch those videos that um, I had, especially the It's History one and the one from Silence. The Kabuki one is up to you. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.